pleased to welcome to the stage Adrian Cronier to introduce our distinguished guest and navigate us on our interesting journey this afternoon. Adrian. Welcome, Jamie. Welcome, Blake. And Bob, long live number 44 forever. The power of sport to unite our community is unrivaled. Thank you for those stories. So good afternoon, everybody. No, no, no. In response to all the questions I received last week, we do not have Leo DiCaprio or Kate Winslet here today. <laughs> we have two much more interesting guests here to tell us about the lessons of the RMS Titanic, from the site exploration, preservation to education. Jessica Saunders and Thomasina Ray from the EM Group. Who knew the Experiential Media Group is located right here in Peachtree Corners? in Atlanta. It is the only company permitted by law to recover artifacts from the Royal Mail ship Titanic, which shockingly sank on April the 15th, 1912. Right about the time this club was founded, right John? Hard to believe. EM Group's affiliate RMS Titanic Incorporated serves as the exclusive steward of the wreck site. The company is dedicated to preserving the legacy of the ship, and all her passengers and crew, and engaging the global community in the RMS Titanic story. Our guests Jessica and Thomasina will tell you that they do not just run a business, they are dedicated to preserving the legacy of the lives of people involved in this tragedy. The company has conducted eight research and recovery expeditions, with the goal of obtaining oceanographic material and scientific data, and using the data and retrieved artifacts for historical verification, scientific education, and public awareness. How about this? They've recovered over 5,500 artifacts over 30 years. And these artifacts have been viewed by more than 25 million viewers across the world. So in preparation for today, I learned something about President John that I did not know. Actually, I learned two things. One, he's a history buff, a real history buff. So he inspired me to watch an older docudrama on the Titanic and the Californian that so tragically did not come to the Titanic's passengers' rescues. Um, here are some startling facts I learned to level set before we get into our fireside chat. So as John said, and we all know, the Titanic was supposed to be an unsinkable boat and it was built to truly monumental scale. In total, it was 882 and a half feet long, 92 and a half feet wide, and 175 feet high it would displace 66,000 tons of water and of course was the largest ship built at the time. Luxuries for the first class passengers included a swimming pool, a Turkish bath, a squash court, that's what I'm talking about Billy, <laughs> and a dog kennel. The Ritz restaurant on board was inspired by the famous Ritz in London's Piccadilly Circus. On board the Titanic were 20,000 bottles of beer, 1,500 bottles of wine, and 8,000 cigars, all for first-class passengers. This sounded like Mark Adler's rotary dinner two years ago. I don't know if Brother Adler's here. The Titanic burned about 600 tons of coal each day to keep it powered. That required a team of 176 men to keep the fires burning. 176. From the time the lookout sounded the alert, the officers on the bridge had only 37 seconds to react before the Titanic hit the iceberg. At 12.45 a.m. on April the 15th, 1912, crew members on the Californian saw mysterious lights in the sky. These were the distress flares sent up from the Titanic, and they immediately woke up their captain to tell him. Unfortunately, the captain issued no orders to help. Sadly, the official number of the dead on the Titanic was 1,503. Of the 2,208 on board, there were 705 survivors. Despite the fact that everyone knew the Titanic sunk, they had no idea of where it precisely happened, and it took 73 years to find the wreckage. Dr. Robert Ballard, an American oceanographer, found the Titanic on September the 1st, 1985. It is now a UNESCO protected site, and the ship lays two miles below the ocean surface with a bow nearly 2,000 feet from the ship's stern. I find that all staggering to think about, let alone 100 years ago. So Jessica and Thomasina, you will know that President John runs a very tight ship, pun, in, pun intended. 
So let's introduce you and I'll invite you each in turn to come to the stage. First, Thomasina Ray is the director of the Titanic Artifact Collection at the EM Group. She has always been fascinated with the power of objects as tangible representations and witnesses to history that allow us to connect to the past through our own experiences. Thomasina has an MA in Museum Studies from the University of Washington with a specialization in collections management and preservation to ensure these artifacts endure to tell their story through exhibitions around the world. Most interestingly, Thomasina tells me she is our esteemed and tireless President John Spin instructor at 6.30 a.m. on Saturdays. I guess that's the day John actually sleeps in for a bit before he crushes another legendary three-set piece breakfast at the Bucket Club. We'll have to have a sidebar about that, Thomasina. <laughs> Welcome to the stage, please, Thomasina. <laughs> Secondly, Jessica Sanders is the CEO of EM Group and the president of RMS Titanic Incorporated. She has been with the organizations and its predecessors since 2007, giving her a unique perspective on the administration and operation of the business. Jessica's leadership philosophy empowers her team to captivate, educate, and inspire through the finest quality exhibitions and entertainment experiences. Her creative spirit, coupled with her business acumen, has contributed to the outstanding success enjoyed by Titanic, the artifact exhibition that has been seen around the world. There is also more to Jessica. She's an accomplished singer in a band wow. called Night Owl, I believe. No, that's not, that's not we'll have a sidebar. Well, welcome, Jessica. So Jessica said there's so much content. We're going to have a few questions around this fake fireside so we can get to Q&A from the audience. So Thomasina, let's cut to the chase. Tell me about President John's stamina at 6 a.m. on a Saturday morning. Well, you know, it's, it's group fitness, so it is a group <laughs> effort, and we're all there to be supported and support each other, so he's definitely part of the team, that's for <laughs> sure. <laughs> Jessica, let's start with you. Why don't you add some color about the Titanic site and what you've preserved? So um, I am, as introduced, the CEO of Experiential Media Check. <laughs> I have to do a mic check, okay. Um, and the president of RMS Titanic Incorporated. And so, as explained, one company is the exhibition company. The other company um, has the salver and possession rights for the rec site, also for all of the IP and the exclusive rights to recover additional artifacts. So you have an exhibition company and you have an artifact company, so we do artifact exhibitions. Hi, John. Um, so, for the rec site, we've done eight expeditions to the rec site. We um, go down and we do imaging, but we also have done recovery in seven of those eight expeditions. The largest expedition that we've done to date was in 2010, where we mapped the entire rec site uh, using sonar. It was the first time that it had ever been done. But you'll see, if you look in the image, to the image to the left, you'll see the, the map that was done uh, with sonar. It is the first map that has ever been done, but it's very difficult to detect in the briefing. Actual items, you see shadows. Thanks. Better. Much better. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you see shadows, but it's very hard to identify individual objects. This summer, we'll be going back to the rec site using unprecedented technology and to re-image the rec site so that in the future we can do targeted artifact recovery. How long did it take to do that imaging? So in 2010, we were at the rec site, gosh, I want to say probably three weeks. And it, wow. was a, it was a combined effort with a bunch of different organizations. This summer, we'll go out by ourselves for three weeks. Wow. So Thomasina, you oversee a 5,500 artifact collection. Why don't you orient us to that vast and special collection? And as you do that, maybe you can tell us about how seeing these artifacts brings the story to life in preserving the legacy of those that died so tragically. Absolutely. So, um, as we mentioned earlier, we have over 5,500 artifacts that we've collected from the rec site. And um, it spans a really wide range of things. So, we have everything from on the right, um, that's what we call Big Piece. That's its official name. Um, it lives in the Luxor in Las Vegas. Um, but it's a 15-ton piece of the hull. So um, originally, this would have been windows into the first class cabins. And it, the, um, when you look at Titanic and you see the big yellow stripe that goes down the side, it would have been right under this row of, of uh, portholes. Um, so you know, that's the biggest thing we've recovered. And then we have 
more delicate things. We have things like, we talked about the champagne bottles and the, the amount of alcohol that was on board. On the far left, that is a champagne bottle with the actual champagne still inside it. Wow. When Titanic sank, um, there is 6,000 PSI at the wreck site. And that pressure seals the bottle even tighter. And that bottle, um, that shape of that bottle is so strong, it was with, able to withstand the forces um, at the bottom of the ocean for 80 years, decades, right? Um, and then we have things that are more personal and more fragile, uh, textiles, things that passengers had with them, um, clothing and papers, letters, um, things that they had, documents to prove who they were when they got to the US, when they were immigrating, um, all sorts of really carefully preserved uh, materials down there. And so seeing these in person, we really hope that you know, it makes a real connection. When you just hear the story of Titanic and you hear about the statistics or you have a crush on Leonardo DiCaprio, like <laughs> you're not, you're, you're drawn in, but you can make a real connection with some of these people or some of these objects when you get to observe those details yourself. You brought some artifacts along today. Why don't you show the audience some of those? Absolutely, so. And you might want to stand to show the audience at the back. <laughs> I don't want to drop these. No. <laughs> so we have, um, this is a rivet. So we always hear about the rivets on Titanic. There were three million of these. Um, and when we recovered a bunch, we actually had them tested. So we could test the composition because part of the controversy had been, well, maybe they were just too brittle. Maybe there was too much inclusion of imperfections. So these were tested. And yes, there were imperfections, but whether or not it was enough to contribute to sinking is really, it's, you know, who's to say? Uh, but we have some of these from the ship so that when you come to the exhibit, you can see parts of the actual ship itself. And then this is um, a third class mug. So each class had their own set of china, um, their own patterns, and um, third class was the most thickest, most um, durable and it was also the simplest decoration. Um, so these would have been serviceable across all of White Star Line ships. You'll notice nothing says Titanic. It all says White Star Line. It's like Hilton. You're not gonna go to a Hilton and see the name of that Hilton on something. It's gonna say just Hilton. So um, yeah, these are a couple of them. Thank you for that. I'm sure seeing those exhibits make it very personal. So Jessica, why don't you build on that? How do you see the legacy of the Titanic from the EM Group's point of view? So the company was, was, our mission is to preserve the legacy of Titanic, her passengers and crew um, in perpetuity for future generations. Um, that mission um, is fulfilled through part strategic partnerships. We tell obviously the, con the conservation of the artifacts, but then also for us, it, changed and expanded just a little bit last summer. So last summer, we lost one of the key members of our team, um, somebody who was a friend and a colleague, um, a person who had led six of our eight expeditions, had the record number of uh, man submersible dives to the wreck site. His name was P.H. Narjolet, and he perished in the Titan submersible accident last summer. So we find ourselves, or I found ourselves, the company found ourselves in a very distressed position because now they called him Mr. Titanic, mm -hmm. but now his legacy is inextricably intertwined with Titanic. So our mission is now not just to preserve the legacy of Titanic and its passengers and crew, but it's also to inspire this next generation of explorers. And for us, ex exploration doesn't have to be in a man submersible to the depths of the ocean. Exploration can be going to that restaurant that you keep passing but you never tried, or stepping outside your comfort zone, or taking a 6.30 a.m. spin class. <laughs> <laughs> it's about inspiring that next generation of those who can, mm -hmm. who will go and see and do for those of us who can't, won't. Yeah, I remember reading that story. By all accounts, he perished doing something he loved. 100%. It was quite poetic. So Thomasina, this collection goes around the world, right? I'm curious to find out, is it a universal exhibition? Is it tailored to certain locations? Absolutely, so we, um, we tell the story kind of in a similar narrative, no matter where we go. We talk about the construction of the ship, 
Um, and then you go up a little boarding ramp and you get to experience what it was like on the ship. We show a lot of the opulence, a lot of the gold, um, the gilded uh, decorations and the chandeliers and, and the china, the things that you would have experienced on your brief journey on Titanic. Um, and then it takes a turn and we talk about the iceberg and the night that it hit the iceberg. And then, um, then we transition into a discovery gallery. So we talk about our work recovering artifacts, um, what those artifacts looked like on the ocean floor when we recovered them, um, a little bit about that. And then, we, and then we really end with what we call the memorial gallery. And that's where we're able to talk about the specific passengers whose things that we have. Uh, we have their artifacts. We've been able to identify them from things like this letter to uh, Mr. Howard A. Irwin. Um, so we have his trunk. So we're able to talk about his life and, um, and what he had on Titanic. So um, that's the kind of general narrative. But each place that we go, we try to bring in something local. And it's not hard to do because Titanic touched so many communities we can find an artifact maybe that was made somewhere in Europe that might have something to do with them, or a passenger that was coming from someplace, or going to someplace where they had family. Um, there's always a connection. Right now we're in Australia where we, I mean, Jessica and I, we were just talking about we're always learning. We just learned that uh, White Star Line actually started in Australia, hmm. and then the name was purchased. So like, we're always able to find a tie into these local communities. And Jessica, the permanent exhibits are where? Orlando and Las Vegas? Correct. Any plans for expansion? Yes. Where? <laughs> I could tell you, but... <laughs> <laughs> talk, talk to me if you're not going to disclose that. Yeah, yeah I'm going to leave it right there. <laughs> the, 40... the, the, the exhibition market coming, coming post-COVID, like any other industry, it's very competitive. And when you find something that's successful, other people want to replicate it and duplicate it. And, I understand. And so... We're in the quiet phase. Yes, and we're in a safe space. All right, you talked about some of the distress that your company has endured over the last year. What are some of the other challenges of this work? So I think that um, all of us are still kind of adapting to what a post-COVID world looks like. We were, uh, at during the height of COVID, our entire base went down to 19 employees. Our permanent venues were closed. Um, everyone was afraid to be around each other, which makes it difficult to put you in experiential and, and learning environments. So some of the challenges in learning how to navigate um, a worldwide pandemic, but then also the way that people experience content is constantly evolving and changing. It used to be that you put things in cases and you put words on walls and they would come and people would thrive with that. But we've acknowledged now and we know that, that people learn differently. They in interact with, it, with content, some like media, some like immersive in, in environments. So trying to come up with innovative and creative ways to connect people to this content the purpose of a legacy is to be able to experience it. We say that if you leave an exhibition and you go home and you hugged your loved ones a little bit closer or you remember a name of a passenger, then we've done our jobs. But the way that people are experiencing it is changing, so keeping up with that is an, an ongoing challenge. I'm sure it's a huge logistical challenge. Tom Cena, maybe you can expand on how you work with partners to balance the utilization of resources in your company. Yeah, so all of, you know, when you look at these artifacts, you can probably see like the stained glass window on the bottom there, that's very, very fragile. And part of our mandate um, as solvers in possession is to share these artifacts as widely as possible and to put them on exhibition. So we really have to balance the fragility of these objects, the fact that they can't last forever, they, the fact that you know, we do tour, so we move these artifacts two to three times a year. Um, so we, even though we have all of the museum standards and that we're all trained in how to do that, um, you never want to overdo that risk of, of traveling things. So um, balancing that, that, that risk with the need to share the stories and to um, share the exhibitions uh, which is also a, a partly a business thing as well because mm -hmm. we, it's, it's not inexpensive to conserve artifacts. It's not inexpensive to do the work that we do. So putting things on exhibition helps balance um, the care of the artifacts as well. I'm sure it's a huge challenge. And I know that you get asked this a lot. 
What is the one fact around the Titanic and its story that very few people know? Oh my god. I didn't know that it had a squash court and I play a lot of squash. <laughs> um, oh my god, there are like, my mind just goes blank <laughs> at that question just because I feel like, I mean, I'm an artifact person, so I always think about the artifacts. And for me, I think the most fascinating thing is just the way, like, I never would have thought you can get paper from the bottom of the ocean after decades, right? That you'd be able to read it. Um, we even have a few photographs. So I think just the conservation story, and, and it, you know, still there. Yeah, that is remarkable. So we're going to have plenty of time for the audience's Q&A, but before we get there, you may know that our theme for the year is leadership lessons for service and growth. And perhaps you can click forward the slide if you don't mind, Thomasina. Jessica, I'm going to ask you the question as the CEO. Um, why don't you share your view on leadership lessons from the Titanic tragedy as it relates to your company, your legacy, and, and your mission? Well... I think probably the first one is this concept of impossible. And, you know, what is, what is our, um, what's impossible in your business or what is impossible in our business? For our Titanic, it was impossible that a piece of ice could, shink, could sink steel luxury liner, right? Until it happened. You know, for us, it was impossible that a worldwide pandemic could shut down an entire industry for three years. Right. Remember when it was three weeks? Oh, just take home work for three weeks. And then it was three months. And then it was three years. So it, the concept of impossible versus actually it's just improbable. But then what do you do when, when it happens? And how do you persevere? Um, I think that... Um, we learn a, a very, I learned a personal, very valuable lesson from the survivors of, of the Titanic incident. When the ship sank and it took two and a half hours to sink and it, at, at some points they didn't know that they were in trouble until they were already in trouble and for many of them it was already too late. And so it's that, that, that consciousness of being aware and being present, but also it took two hours in the freezing cold in the North Atlantic waiting, not knowing if help was going to come. So what's the story of perseverance there? How do you do, how do you keep going? How do you keep rowing when you feel like you can't keep rowing anymore? You know, and as business leaders, for us, we set the example. There's an accountability lesson here. There's responsibility. Bruce Ismay survived and was shunned. He lived, he lived a life that was ostracized because he is a leader and as a man, he should have gone down with the ship and yet he didn't. So we're not only responsible for the product that we put out, but for the people that we're supposed to take care of, our employees and our teams, but then also the service that we provide to public. We've summarized those five points on that slide. I think you've headed well. Effective communication, risk management, ask not what will go right, but what could go wrong. Decision making under pressure, 37 seconds to make a decision. Accountability and responsibility that uh, docudrama on the Californian was very, very interesting. And then continuous learning um, and improvement. So thank you very much for answering those prepared questions. We're gonna turn it over to Q&A for the audience. So I don't know if there's microphones. Maybe Mike John, right you can Mike moderate. right over here, and please uh, feel free to ask questions. And, and as we jump into the questions too, let me ask about the investigation afterwards, the lessons learned and the length of the investigation and, and how, what the conclusions were coming out of that and how it resulted in changes in, frankly, the way people now contribute and actually run an operation. Jessica? Absolutely. So a lot of policy comes out of mistakes or, or failures, right? So we see a lot of things in your, in your current ocean travel, the, the drills that you go through, if you've ever been on a cruise, the mandate that there's enough lifeboats on board comes from Titanic. The ice patrol that comes and warns of, of icebergs in the area is to prevent another tragedy that comes from Titanic. The drills that you have to go through on how to put on a life jacket and what to do and where you're supposed to go, that comes from Titanic. Again, these... We, People are criticized because they said, well, look at the arrogance of this crew that, you know, they thought that it was unsinkable. It was deemed impossible. So we're learning these lessons now. Milton? Yes. Uh, this is a question for Thomasina. Um, it's an artifact question. Okay. I grew up 
with a West Indian grandfather who, when he left Jamaica, uh, worked for the Astors and told the story of being in the home of the Astors when they got the news that John Jacob Astor IV had died. So I was just wondering if you were able to recover any artifacts from John Jacob Astor. We, we do not have any of Astor's artifacts. Um, he was on board with his um, young new wife who was pregnant and she made it off the ship. Uh, we do not have any of his things, um, unfortunately, no. Thank you. So tell us about the, yes, Jim. I have a quick question. This may seem silly, but you're not near an ocean. <laughs> Why in the world are you in Atlanta? <laughs> <laughs> this is you. This is me. We uh, one of uh, one of our, our expedition team uh, members is from Dublin, and he. I thought you were going with why are we in Las Vegas? He always says, "Oh yes, the great seafaring town of Las Vegas." <laughs> For the, um, we are in Atlanta. The company was founded in uh, 1987, I believe, was our first expedition. And it was registered in Florida. The owner liked Atlanta. The, frankly, the owner liked Buckhead, had an apartment down here in Buckhead. And so we've been here for 30 years plus. Yeah. Good morning. Um, do you all have, you said you didn't have anything that said... Uh, Titanic, it said White Star. Do you have anything, though, that has been recovered that says Titanic that dispels the rumor that this was not the Olympic for insurance purposes? A hundred percent. So, uh, in the... <laughs> <Here> she goes. <laughs> uh, so, Harlan and Wolf, the shipyard that made Titanic, that built Titanic, every ship that was in that yard had a hull number. And then pieces of that ship were marked with that hull number so that when they got there, they know where to put them. So um, Titanic was whole 401. So Titanic's pieces are marked 401. So um, if you go to, for instance, our exhibit in Las Vegas or our exhibit right now, we have one in Florida that has a piece marked 401 and Columbus, Ohio. You can, if you look real carefully, and this is why it's fun to go on a tour with collections people, is we can point to and show you where it says 401. Um, we also have passengers tickets that they were originally supposed to go, say, on Majestic, which was another one of White Star Line ships. Um, but they, because of the coal strike, White Star Line put everybody on Titanic so that they could put all their coal on one ship and make this maiden voyage. So um, we have their, their, their paperwork with Majestic struck out and Titanic on it. So it's 100% Titanic. Otherwise, I don't know what I'm doing with my job. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Not a conspiracy. <laughs> Stephanie. So two questions from our table. One, we want to know the science behind how the paper was preserved. And two, these expeditions to get down that deep have to be um, expensive and require a lot of advanced science and technology. Are you also collecting data on what's happening in the ocean down there as well for other scientific opportunities? Okay, so I'll talk about the artifact part. Um, leather is cured with chemicals, and the chemicals that cure leather are actually really resilient and uh, repel the microorganisms that are at the bottom of the ocean that would otherwise eat the organic material. So when we have things like textiles or paper goods, they were all in leather bags. Um, so, and that's why we're able to identify those passengers a lot of time is because we have the full collection of their things that were in that bag. Um, and yeah, it's just a very cool process. And so like metal that survives outside of a bag actually deteriorates inside the bag while the paper, it's, it's opposite. Paper and metal are opposite in that behavior um, on the bottom of the ocean. As to the second half of, of the question and the studies of the ocean, studying Titanic in particular, the, particularly the deterioration at the wreck site does tell us quite a bit about our oceans. And it, Titanic is in a particularly harsh environment. It's completely dark, it's very cold, it, the sediment is very acidic. And so studying the deterioration at the wreck site over time gives us information about our oceans in general and the currents. Um, in this next expedition that we're going down, because we're able to use better technology, we're able to go a little bit further into that research and study. Ready? 
Good morning. I'm curious, as you're um, doing these expeditions and, and you're having an experience as you are discovering certain artifacts, I'm, I'm interested in just your perspective on that, but how do you decide what to bring up and what to leave in the site? You go ahead. <laughs> so previous expeditions really had been orchestrated as recovery of opportunity. And so you, if you'll imagine a man submersible with manipulator arms going down to a specific location, and in that location, we know pretty much from the map, when the ship sank and it broke apart, it spewed um, the contents in a, across a vast area, but in a really generalized area. So a man submersible goes down with, with manipulator arms, and you have things in this debris field, and you have items of, of interest. You may or may not know what it is or how it leads to the story, but it's an item of interest. In future expeditions, what we intend to do is, again, using this imagery, we can study it and use the criteria that says, what, are, what artifacts are at risk? We think that, uh, as opposed to some views, we think that leaving artifacts to be lost to the sea twice is a tragedy as well. So what items are at risk? What items can tell, help us tell the story better? As Thomasina mentioned, items that are stored in uh, leather, help us tell passenger stories and help us give a picture in time. But then also, um, what items um, will be of interest to the public? So when we come back, we'll say, okay, here's 10 items, public. What would you like to see recovered? What would you like to see conserved? People that uh, are into Titanic, they have a very broad level of interest. So um, it helps to uh, get people engaged. Uh, how about Atlantans on the ship? I know of one one who went down with the ship. Uh, I think he was a Frenchman, but do you have any intel on that? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Atlantans. Atlantans, you know, oh, yeah. Atlantans. The Strausses were from Georgia. from Georgia. So the founders, Macy's department store, um, Isidore and Ida Strauss were on the ship. Um, they're kind of, when you see the James Cameron movie, the couple spooning as the ship goes down, loosely, um, but she, she was about to get on board a lifeboat and um, her husband wasn't allowed to go, so she said, you know what, we've lived our lives together, I'm gonna stay with wow. him, so she got out. Um, and I know they're from, they're from South Georgia, wow. but they, they had um, been running Macy's department store. Wow. That truly is one of the most beautiful stories. Like, this, wow. this content area is so rich. Whether you've seen the movie, whether you've gone to an exhibition, learn more. There's just so much here about our humanity. Follow up the ship, follow up. Well, I do know there's a plaque over at the Capitol City. So we all might be interested in that. We have a piece of history right here. Michael. Um, can you tell us more about uh, your business model, uh, specifically kind of your revenue sources that, that fund your operations? Absolutely. So as I mentioned when we first started, um, it's two peer organizations. RMS Titanic Inc. is a sovereign possession and, and it has the ownership to the artifacts and the IP, 30 years of research and future salvage rights. Experiential Media Group is the operating company or the exhibition producing company. So that's your cases, your lighting, your trust, uh, um, ticket tearing, that kind of thing. So with the majority of our revenue comes from ticket sales, but we also run our own merchandising as well. We run our merchandising as gift shop and retail stores, but then also online and e-commerce. So Adrian, you talked about the Californian, and it may be an interesting leadership lesson too about coming to the rescue mm -hmm. of your colleague. Can you tell a little bit about the story of the Californian and why it was that a ship didn't come to the rescue of the Titanic sooner. Well, it sounds like, John, you probably could tell that story better than me. <laughs> it, wasn't even, it wasn't even the closest ship to the Titanic, right? Californian, I believe, was one of the closest, but I, it really had to do, again, no regulations about telegraph systems, right? So Titanic had a Marconi operating system. They were running telegraphs for their... Um, clients basically all day. They're, they're paid by the number of letters that they can like get over that little Morse code system as quick as they can. So their operators are up late, they're working really hard, or actually they weren't up, they got up to send the distress calls. All the other ship Marconi operators and all the other ship telegraph operators, they just go to sleep at night. 
they're not listening for the, there's no telephones, there's no way to communicate, so um, they all went to bed and Titanic had already told a couple of them to shut up. Titanic had already said, hey, wow. I'm trying to send out telegraphs about my passengers' day on how much they love this ship. Don't tell me about icebergs. Like, I'm busy. And so they were like, well, fine, Titanic. We're not. You do you. <laughs> so there had been some, some warnings with respect to potential icebergs. Yeah. And they were ignored. Correct. So, so as Thomasina said, the, the wireless operators were trying to do their job. And it's one of those moments where, you know, you, get, you keep getting the tap on the shoulder, hey, watch out, and it's, I'm trying to do my job here. The navigation is up to the captain and, and the lookouts. I am trying to do my job, shut up and keep this, this line clear. Back to effective communication as a leadership <laughs> lesson, right? So what about the lookout? There was, uh, as we say, iceberg right ahead, it was in the movie. Um, Somebody saw the iceberg. Tell us a little bit about the story of that individual. Frederick Fleet. I don't actually, he was after the artifacts, his story. Yeah. We have the crow's nest bell. We do have the, um, the bell from the crow's nest that they would have rung um, when they saw the iceberg and the telephone actually. So the ship's communication was single point to single point. It didn't really have connecting lines. So there was a telephone you pick up and it goes directly from one point to another point. Um. So here's, here's the thing. Um, you don't have to be a historian to learn lessons from history. In this one incident, you've got three classes of people. It was, Titanic was the first non-war international tragedy. The, the thing that was never supposed to happen and yet literally three different classes, the, the world's richest and, and the, the group that was going that had, that had a tremendous immigration story all in the same boat and the same time. It was a very unique thing which creates a lot of entry points into the story. There's always something that you can gravitate to. You know, this story is about hope. Um, people packing up every, their whole lives just for the opportunity of what they might find when they reach those shores and they, some of them never did. People who were the richest of the rich and in Bordian society coming down the grand staircase in their, in their nice, in their fine wear, to just to be seen. Your, fire, your firemen, they were called. The stokers, the ones that worked to keep the fires lit. There's so many threads within the story that create moments for self-reflection. Could you or would you have put your loved one into a lifeboat? Could you have rowed away and watched your loved one sinking? How do you go on? Mm -hmm. Some of these people lost everything. You talked about the Macy's family. Could you have not gotten into a lifeboat just because your husband couldn't go? I don't know. We like to think that we would do the best in situations and we'll be the best version of ourselves. But you don't know. And it's stories like this that cause, call you to ask those questions and give that perspective. And maybe try a little bit harder. We, like I mentioned earlier, there are a lot of historians that we get to work with. There's somebody could, that can tell you exactly how many rivets were on that ship. I can't tell you. All I can tell you is that it's a privilege and an honor to be able to take them to the public so that you will go and learn how many rivets are on the ship. Jessica Thomasina, thank you for these leadership lessons. Adrian, thank you for leading. Well done. Please make a note, next week, the power of purposeful leadership. Bill Rogers, the CEO and chairman of Truist, in conversation with Katie Saez, who is the EVP of Georgia, or Georgia region for Truist. And then on April 22nd, we're fortunate to have leadership lessons by building strength, stability, and self-reliance by Jonathan Reckford. Thanks for joining us today. Come up and thank our speakers. Media adjourned.